Right, so, so this is supposed to be a title of my sh uh, short talk. Uh, I, I thought I will start by introducing myself and uh, uh, telling you why uh, you might want to catch me later and talk to me about miscellaneous things th 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 that I do. Uh, I'm kind of a weird species of uh, scientist, you will see why. Perhaps I'm most interesting not as a scientist at all, but as a guinea pig. Uh, I think I can substantiate the claim that my, uh, my own genome is the best characterized human genome on the planet among genomes which are available. Uh, so it's been selected by the American National Institute of Standards as the genome to have a standard genome. And then if that piques your curiosity, I'm happy to comment some more. Uh, so you are the one type <laughs> <laughs> uh, This is a, a book cover of my dissertation, which was done in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And you see that nowhere there uh, it talks about biology. Uh, and uh, so my one uh, maybe f uh, most known contribution from the point of view of machine learning to biology is this paper which uh, I'm a lead co-author of and I'm uh, happy to say it's been cited something like 7,000 times in seven years. Pretty good. And uh, so Rudy and I think a couple other people mentioned this system Polyphen. Uh, in 30 seconds this is a server and method which takes human protein and tells you whether this amino acid substitution is going to change the function of this protein. So it's the, the best, the most used system. I can tell you it's only slightly better than the coin flip, but it's the best. Uh, so uh, at some point, uh, still being machine learning guy, I ran into Mark Kirchner, whom I believe most of you know. And uh, uh, he suggested I come to the department, spend a few months, find application for machine learning. Uh, it's been many years. Um, I'm still at the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School. And uh, I actually do some of my own experiments, which all look very much the same. Uh, I do in vitro fertilization. Usually it's with frogs, sometimes other species. And uh, I stand there with a clock watch, with a stopwatch, very carefully timing and killing embryos at certain points. And then I ask, what are those made of? RNA, protein other molecules and try to reason about systems. So uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, a two-year, maybe three-year-old story now that, again, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of. Uh, it's already, uh, uh, so there, there are two interesting points here which are going to become relevant later. If there is a system where, for several time points, you measure in parallel RNA and protein, just from those measurements alone, with no uh, isotopic labeling, you could fit to parameter simple model and recover synthesis rate and degradation rate. Uh, and so we've done this for genome scale at that point and redoing this now. Uh, I, I don't think I need to tell you that uh, synthesis and degradation rates for proteins genome-wide are important and useful in many ways. One kind of uh, systems embryology application that I'm proud of. I, I don't think there are many questions in biology where you can ask a question which results in the number, right? So here's the question. If I take uh, an embryo, which is a tadpole, swimming, breathing fish with a beating heart, uh, I put it in the mixer, I reach in and I take a molecule. Was this molecule of protein synthesized in the embryo or was this deposited by the mother? And uh, so this graph here gives you an answer that after 50 hours in this, uh, after fertilization in this organism, about 30% of protein molecules are made anew. So, right, so this tells you something about the systems, how embryo prepares protein versus makes protein on the, on the fly, different uh, protein specialized for some cell type versus housekeeping and so forth. Uh, How do you measure the, new, the newly made protein? I'm sorry? How do you measure the newly That will take me about an hour to explain. Uh, so, uh, the, <laughs> so, yes, yes, pl please come to my poster for this. So, uh, then uh, this is to say I've been fortunate to 
be part of the team that developed uh, the so-called indrops, a droplet barcoding protocol which allows you to look at uh, expression of RNA uh, at a single cell level. Uh, right, so when you take a system and you get mixed population of cells, right, what comes out of this experiment, whatever you do it with, is a giant matrix of cells by genes. What do you do with it is a big question. Uh, so you could try to reason about clusters in this population, but they're not necessarily clusters. You could try to reason about the whole manifold, but what kind of manifold? Those are questions which are ripe for mathematics, I think. Um, so uh, we were very lucky to get Caleb Weinreb, the student who developed the system of representing <coughs> such data uh, that, that really enabled this field, I could say. Uh, the first thing I asked you to take the mental image of is a system called spring where every point is a cell and then two cells which are very similar in the uh, space of gene expression are linked by spring. So it relaxes and becomes a manifold representing uh, something. So what did we do with these tools? Well, we went back to my favorite kind of experiment. We just took time points of developing embryo. We stuck it into the single cell profiling setup. And I must say, this is a teamwork of two very talented students and two lab heads. Uh, and you get this sort of data, right? So what is this messy slide tells you? There are 10 time points in development where each time point has many thousands of cells. It's a giant, I think it's probably the biggest to this day data set of its kind of 130,000 individual cells. Uh, right, wh wh what do you do with this data? So one idea is that you take adjacent points uh, and connect into developmental tree. Very roughly it works like this. You start at the last point. Uh, this is last time point. You find a state. You choose a parent state in the previous time point, and then you iterate. That gives you a tree. Right. So that's great. The tree is very helpful. Uh, but you can also take all of 130,000 cells, put it into spring, and get this kind of a manifold representation. Now we can stop doing embryology with this data, right? Because if you think about this, uh, all sorts of reverse engineering of biology can come out of this data set. And this is what I'm going to be busy doing for the next 15 years, I think. Uh, right, because first, there is time dimension. You could see that stem cell somewhere here starts and in a few hours goes out on the bridge and differentiate. You can ask which genes are important. You can reconstruct cascades of transcription factor chains and so forth. You could ask, you could look at the branching point and ask how decisions are made. You can simply ask which genes co-vary, absent and present together. You can begin to get all sorts of systemic information like uh, protein complexes out of this. Finally, thinking back to the beginning of my talk, you can get synthesis and degradation rate and turn RNA, which we can measure, into protein, which we cannot and will not be able to measure in a single cell level for decades, probably. Uh, so, so, a reason. Uh, so, with this in mind, we thought, well, we could spend 15 years analyzing this data, but it's already a very rich resource. And so, just a month ago, I uh, organized what we called single cell jamboree. Janelia HHMI generously sponsored this meeting where we invited 26 mostly very advanced senior people in the field of embryology, specifically embryology of frog, to come be trained to use our tools and look at this data. So what there's, uh, there are uh, jamborees which happen for genomes when people just sequence Drosophila, for example, and look to understand what genes mean. Now this is the first ever similar effort where uh, an expert in kidney, in blood, in neurons went and said, all right, I recognize some genes, I don't recognize others, annotate and give us bona fide sets of uh, cells which are differentiated or differentiating. And so again, in itself, it's going to be a very rich resource. Just uh, 
very briefly the whole effort were organized roughly like this. So this is our tree. This is a giant poster that we had on the wall there. And uh, each expert received a small subtree here, took all of the cells, which are ten tens of thousands of cells, which are just between two adjacent time points, uh, and popped this substructure out in the browser in order to understand that particular snapshot in the process of differentiation and wrote a short essay about this. The, you know, the, the, so what are recognizable markers, what are novel markers, are there any new cell types? Uh, th this sort of uh, information falls out of that. As if uh, a frog data was not enough, we compared this whole tree in frog to a matching effort uh, also from our department in zebrafish and asked about uh, conservation. Are cell types conserved? Are the same genes used in the same way in this process? Uh, do cell types fall out of the tree through the same root? Uh, and so forth. So again, there are some surprises here. Uh, so at this point, uh, I think it's clear that with all of this information, uh, my uh, talk looks to you like a paper which unfortunately I think becomes kind of too popular in major journals now. All right, I call it revolutionary technology enables unprecedentedly deep and expensive data set which confidently reveals a new depth of our ignorance about embryogenesis. Uh, so I, I would appreciate a chance to convince you otherwise, but that will take some time and effort and at the poster. In 15 years. Today. <laughs> In 15 years, you want to give the testimony today? Yeah, it's a five minutes. Okay. Right, so I mean, I, I think I can open for questions. On your previous slide, was the zebrafish and xenopus data independently processed? In other words, are they independent trees? Uh, yeah, man, in the, I, I don't understand the question. Independently dissociated, independently collected, independently went through the setup. Analyzed. Oh, yes, absolutely independently analyzed through the process, which I sort of illustrated uh, here. Right, so, so you, you just uh, cluster every time point. Uh, from the marker genes in that cluster, understand which cell type is that, and connect backwards in time, get and get to trees. So both trees show a perhaps surprising characteristic of very early divergence. In other words, there's this was one of surprises. Absolutely right. Uh, so there was a huge uh, effort by community to create this kind of ontology, uh, and we co uh, compared. So mostly consistent, but many cell types look to be emerging much earlier than we thought. So one of the um, <clears throat> goals of the new Chan Zuckerberg Institute is to find the, the human cell atlas to find all the cell types in humans. And that seems to me maybe you've already done that for xenopus and zebrafish? Or? Uh, yes, I think so. Also, mind you, that they're working with dead people. That creates for a certain bias in the cell type. <laughs> but so how many cell types? I mean, how? I guess it depends how you define a cell type. Th this is Kirchner's question. I really hate it. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is like how many colors are there, uh, right? You can zoom in, and things would cluster and cluster some more and cluster some more, depending on which genes you would look at. So you can kind of very rapidly get lost in this universe uh, of representations. So yeah, I, I think it can be defined rigorously. Uh, we are talking about 300 cell types. Mind you, this is early development. This is gastrula neurula. Uh, and uh, so, you know, there are probably thousands of cells we never see in this. Thousands of cell types we don't see here. Excuse me. So how do you know <coughs> the linkage between the cells? I didn't get that. The different stages, how can you link them? Oh, so about any two cells you can, uh, or any two groups of cells, you can just ask, are they similar in the space of gene expression? Uh, right? So you just say this uh, sample, which was taken two hours later than this sample, contains a few cells which look a lot like these cells, yet different. And that's how you make this decision. 
right? Okay, so in this analysis, you lost the location of the cells in the embryo, right? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, it's super important. There are several labs aggressively working on the ways to uh, uh, inject the plasmid, which will allow you to reconstruct the true lineage uh, by barcoding, but it is lost in this data. You can recover a lot of it because there is a very rich set of in situ for these embryos. Uh, and so just going by markers, uh, you could do the, you could register the cell based on its expression profile. To in using several in situ. So, so let's suppose that you're having an asymmetric division. You have asymmetric division going on already at this stage, right? Okay. So how could you, how do you know, since it's asymmetric, the properties also are asymmetric, so how can you link now to the common? I don't think we can do it perfectly. I mean, the, 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 I mean th this is a good example of things we're not going to see un until we sequence deeper, and I also don't take samples two hours apart. I take samples, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes apart, uh, so that they have enough cells which are similar enough. I think that's what it boils down to. Um, right? I don't believe that asymmetric division will create two cells which are completely different from one another. Most of the genes are probably going to be similar, yet there are going to be principal differences in transcription factors and signaling molecules. and Maybe not. So why did you pick Xenopus and not Drosophila? In Drosophila, you can actually back everything with genetic analysis. It's impossible mm -hmm. to do genetics in Xenopus. Uh, it's only descriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I can Nobody give... We can do genetics in Xenopus. Would you like a, a polite or an honest answer? <laughs> give me an honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, seriously speaking, uh, uh, large cells are important. We're looking only at about, uh, let's say, 1 to 5 percent of the transcriptome. The, uh, the rest is getting lost in the pipes. Uh, and so, uh, giant cells. W one important reason. You can do morpholinos and CRISPR knockouts in Xenopus. Yeah, you can do a lot. I, I don't think there's Ophelis in any way superior to Xenopus, but that's being a groupie. What is just dissociating the cells? How does that impact the profiles? That uh, I could talk for hours about adventures of, of finding dissociation protocol, so that's very important. Um, I think it uh, introduces very little bias, uh, and we had to work it out three times. Uh, it took a year to work out in three different species that we've done. I didn't mention the third species at all. But uh, a brief answer is you dissociate rapidly. And within minutes, everything is on ice. So most of the processing happens on ice. There are, there's probably some response, but... Uh, so I realize your analysis is in progress, but can you give us a little bit of a flavor for... I mean, you should start seeing blood. I'm not supposed to say this, but I think it's coming out in science pretty soon, actually. Okay, so what's the difference in your map versus the classical hematology? As far as it's uh, classical hematology. Well, as far as the well, we differentiation of various lymphocyte subtypes and such. Well, uh, we are not that far in development at all to s to even begin to see those things. But there is classical Xenopus atlas, which we did compare to, and as I mentioned, uh, it match uh, matches beautifully. Uh, surprises are mostly in terms of how early things begin to be defined. I guess I don't know what stage 22 means. Oh, there was a little picture there. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's a, a little fish which... Uh, uh, it's sort of like a, like a, a little fish looking sausage where, which has uh, not even gotten its, its first uh, heartbeat. So how early can you see neuron differentiation, brain differentiation? Uh, you ask about brain differentiation? Yeah. How well, when, when do you start to see? Um, it depends on the definition of brain. We have a lot of uh, types of neurons right. uh, where we recognize familiar markers. Uh, right? But all of this is RNA. And so if you want to know about the functional uh, thing, I cannot say anything uh, yet. But we do see 
at the latest stage uh, types of neurons. So if you go to the poster, I'll uh, zoom in with you and look at different neural types. So you, you said between the two, is, uh, you have around 5% of transcriptome measured in the two species, how much this is? No, I'm saying every single cell uh, gives me, shows me about 1 to 5% of RNA molecules that in the cell, the rest is lost. But as soon as I've taken several cells of a certain kind and averaged, I have a very good representation. Okay, and comparing the two species, how, how much this transcriptome is shared in the different stages? Uh, I mean, first of all, something I really don't like to admit is that uh, zebrafish has much smaller cells, but seem to show us high percentage uh, for every cell. Um, you are asking how similar is the expression across tissues. Uh, to my taste, you know, we can discuss million metrics of this comparison, but to my taste, it is surprisingly not conserved. Uh, you recognize what you recognize, markers for cells and neuro for neurons and muscle, but those are the ones we have been studying for 20 years because they show up everywhere and very easily. But if you dig a little deeper, there's, uh, to my taste, again, very little conservation. What is the minimum number of cells that you need for this analysis? <sighs> Tough question. <laughs> Thousands? What? Well, uh, we did the first round of analysis with 50,000 across 10 stages. Uh, we've seen much more when we added another 80,000. Uh, so I, I don't know how to think about the minimal. No, because, because this could change the data, depending how many cells you have. Because you lose, when you have a small number of cells, you lose some of the cells with a certain signature. Uh, absolutely. Right. But we will only know this retrospectively. After we have done 10 million cells, we will know how things change. Okay, we are supposed to go further, and uh, all questions could be asked during the panel discussion. So maybe actually, yeah, the short talks are meant to uh, just draw people to the posters. And so we can continue and, and discussing. And of course, continue posters. discussion during the Post. panel session, or poster oh. session, or other way. And we uh, will move to next speaker.